BOA won the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, we tell you about a process that could open the international ocean floor to mining. Brian Lynn presents this week's science report. Finally, we present our U.S. National Parks series. Our first stop is Theodore Roosevelt National Park in North Dakota. But first, the International Seabed Authority, or ISA, is the United Nations body that makes rules about the world's ocean floor. It is preparing to continue negotiations that could open the international seabed for mining, including for materials central to the move to green energy. The organization will soon need to begin accepting mining permit applications after years of negotiations. But environmental activists and some scientists are expressing concerns over the possible effects on animal life and the deep-sea environment. Deep-sea mining involves removing minerals and metals from the ocean seabed. There are three kinds of deep-sea mining. The first involves taking materials, known as polymetallic nodules, off the ocean floor. The second involves mining seafloor sulfite deposits. And the third involves taking cobalt crusts from rock. These mined materials contain nickel, rare earth, cobalt, and more. Such materials are needed for batteries and are used in developing renewable energy. The materials are also for everyday technology, like phones and computers. Companies and governments view these resources as very important as current reserves decline and demand continues to rise. Countries control their ocean territory and special economic areas, but the high seas and the international ocean floor are governed by the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Seas. It is considered to be a rule for all states, whether or not they have signed or officially approved it. Under the treaty, the seabed and its mineral resources are considered the common heritage of mankind. The resources must be managed in a way that protects the interests of humanity. The idea is to share economic benefits, support scientific research, and protect ocean environments. Companies interested in deep-sea mining are partnering with countries to help them get exploration licenses. More than 30 exploration licenses have been issued so far. Most of these have activity in an area called the Clarion-Clipperton Fracture Zone, which crosses 4.5 million square kilometers between Hawaii and Mexico. The UN Convention on the Law of the Seas says that the ISA is supposed to complete rules governing deep-sea mining by July 2023. Countries and private companies can start applying for early, or provisional, licenses if the UN body fails to approve a set of rules by July 9th. Yet environmental activists and scientists are concerned about deep-sea mining. Only a small part of the deep seabed has been explored, and some 
worry that the environment will be damaged by mining. Engineering and technology used for deep sea mining are still developing. Some companies are looking to get materials from the sea floor using large pumps. Others are developing artificial intelligence based technology that would teach deep sea robots how to get materials from the floor. Some are looking to use special machines that could mine materials off the sides of underwater mountains and volcanoes. Damage from mining can include noise and light pollution, as well as possible leaks and spills of fuels and other chemicals used in the mining process. The full effects on the deep sea environment remain unclear, but scientists have warned that biodiversity loss is sure to happen and could be irreversible. Christopher Kelly is a biologist with research expertise in deep sea ecology. We're constantly finding new stuff, and it's a little bit early to start mining the deep sea when we don't really understand the biology, the environments, or anything else, he said. The ISA's Legal and Technical Commission, which oversees the development of deep sea mining regulations, will meet in early July to discuss the mining rules. The earliest that mining under ISA rules could begin is in late 2024 or 2025. Applications for mining must be considered, and environmental studies need to be carried out. For now, some companies, such as Google, Samsung, BMW, and others, have backed the World Wildlife Fund's call to promise to avoid using minerals that have been mined from the planet's oceans. More than ten countries, including France, Germany, and several Pacific Island nations, have officially called for a ban or pause on deep-sea mining, at least until environmental protections are in place. Other countries, such as Norway, are proposing opening their waters to mining. I'm John Russell. And I'm Ashley Thompson. Scientists say that for the first time, they have observed gravitational waves caused by black holes and other huge space objects moving through the universe. A group of international scientists using radio telescopes in North America, Europe, China, India, and Australia made the observation. The existence of gravitational waves was first predicted more than 100 years ago by physicist Albert Einstein as part of his general theory of relativity. Einstein's theory proposed that gravity is caused by a curving of space and time. Scientists believe that as gravitational waves travel through space, they press against and stretch everything they pass through. But researchers have struggled for many years to find solid evidence of the waves. In the 1970s, researchers found indirect proof by studying the motion of two crashing stars. That work was honored as part of the 1993 Nobel Prize in Physics. Then, in 2016, 
astronomers announced they had detected the first direct evidence of gravitational waves. That evidence came from an American-based research project known as the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, or LIGO. The LIGO project used ground-based telescope instruments to detect a gravitational wave produced when two black holes crashed into each other about 1.3 billion light-years from Earth. But the LIGO effort was only able to pick up waves at high frequencies. In the latest research, scientists were attempting to find low-frequency waves as a way to confirm gravitational wave signals. The researchers said they successfully discovered such signals using about 15 years of data from a project called Nanograv. This project has long used telescopes across North America to search for low-frequency gravitational waves. The results were recently published in a study in the Astrophysical Journal of Letters. The research involved scientists aiming a series of radio telescopes at dead stars called pulsars. The pulsars send out radio wave signals as they spin around in space. These signals are so predictable that scientists know exactly when the radio waves are supposed to arrive on Earth. The pulsars are like a perfectly regular clock ticking away far out in space, said Nanograv member Sarah Vigeland. She is an astrophysicist at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. But gravitational waves can affect the distance between Earth and the pulsars, which can change the signal activity. The researchers examined small changes in the ticking rate across 68 different pulsars. Some signals came early while others came late. The scientists said this research method provided enough evidence that gravitational waves were passing through. So far, this method has not been able to identify exactly where these low-frequency waves are coming from, said Mark Kamienkowski. He is an astrophysicist at Johns Hopkins University who was not involved with the latest research. But Kamienkowski told the Associated Press the process does demonstrate how low-frequency gravitational waves appear to produce a continuous background noise. He compared the sound to what a person hears when standing in the middle of a party. You'll hear all of these people talking, but you won't hear anything in particular, Kamienkowski said. The discovered background noise is louder than some scientists had expected, said Chiara Mingarelli. She is a member of the Nanograv team and an astrophysicist at Yale University. Mingarelli told the AP this could mean there are more or bigger incidences of black holes coming together in space than previously thought. Or it may suggest there could be other sources of gravitational waves that could raise new questions about the formation of the universe. For example, another theory is that gravitational waves could be left over from a fast expansion period that came right after the Big Bang. 
The Big Bang is the explosion many scientists believe created the universe. Michael Keith was a member of the research team and works with the European Pulsar Timing Array, a collection of research telescopes. He said the galaxies between Earth and the Big Bang were likely drowning out such gravitational waves. In the future, scientists say low-frequency gravitational waves could provide even more information about early expansion of the universe. In addition, such a study could also help expand research on the mysteries of dark matter. I'm Brian Lynn. Now, Brian Lynn joins me to talk more about his science report. Hi, Brian. Thanks for being here. Of course, Ashley. Thanks for having me. This week's report dealt with the first observance by scientists of gravitational waves caused by huge objects moving through the universe. The report notes that researchers have long searched for direct evidence of these waves, but were not able to do so. Why was the discovery made this time around? Yes, so the researchers said this particular observance was made possible by using a collection of telescopes equipped with sensitive instruments and that are deployed around the world. And these are special radio telescopes designed specifically to look for and identify gravitational waves. And they said this large effort of equipment and scientists was necessary to confirm the new discovery. The report also describes the telescopic equipment used to pick up low-frequency waves rather than high-frequency waves observed in the past. How did this help in the discovery? So the team said the reason this observation was not made sooner is because the telescopes used in the past were only good at picking up waves at higher frequencies. But in this case, the equipment and methods used were able to capture low-frequency waves. And as explained in the report, the researchers used the telescopes and a method to observe dead stars called pulsars, which give off lower-frequency gravitational waves. Well, thanks again, Brian, for joining me today. You're welcome. Thank you, Ashley. VOA Learning English has launched a new program for children. It is called Let's Learn English with Anna. The new course aims to teach children American English through asking and answering questions and experiencing fun situations. For more information, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. Woodrow Wilson, America's 28th president, established the National Park Service in 1916 to protect the wild and wonderful landscapes in the United States. But it is an earlier leader who is considered the father of America's national parks. In 1906, Theodore Roosevelt, America's 26th president, signed the American Antiquities Act. The law permitted him and future presidents to take immediate action to protect important cultural or natural resources. The Antiquities Act 
led to the creation of many of the 413 sites within the National Park Service today. No president has played a bigger role in protecting the country's natural and cultural resources than Theodore Roosevelt. During his time in office, he established five new national parks and 18 national monuments. In all, he protected over 93 million hectares of public land. He became known as the conservationist president. Roosevelt's concern for the land and environment came from the time he spent in the Dakota Territory, beginning in the 1880s. The area where he traveled is now the state of North Dakota. Today, you will find a national park there named in his honor. The park protects badlands, wildlife, scenic views, as well as two ranches where Roosevelt himself once lived. Welcome to Theodore Roosevelt National Park. Theodore Roosevelt came to Dakota Territory in September 1883. He was a young married man from New York, where his political career was just beginning. He came to Dakota in hopes of hunting huge animals called bison. He also had a great interest in the western frontier lifestyle. Roosevelt soon developed an interest in raising cattle. Cattle ranching in Dakota was a big business in the 1880s. Cattle fed on the land's healthful grasses. He and a partner entered the business. Roosevelt invested $14,000 to build the Maltese Cross Ranch. Roosevelt returned to New York while workers constructed the ranch. He resumed his political duties in Albany, the state capital. But in early 1884, he experienced two great personal losses. His mother and wife died of illnesses on the same day, February 14th. Roosevelt described the pain and loss in his diary with only one sentence. The light has gone out of my life. Roosevelt again headed west in the summer of 1884. He sought to escape the reminders of his recent losses. He arrived at his newly built Maltese Cross ranch. He also decided to build a second ranch in a quieter, more remote area. He called that ranch Elkhorn. Roosevelt traveled between New York and Dakota, working both as a state lawmaker and a cattle rancher. In late 1884, he helped form an organization in Dakota to help protect ranchers' rights. In 1885, Roosevelt published his first book about his experiences as a rancher and hunter. In it, he predicted that the cattle industry of the Dakota Badlands was not sustainable. In other words, it would not last. Roosevelt was right. Severe weather struck the area in 1886 and 1887. In the winter, a terrible freeze killed many cattle. The animals that survived the cold soon starved. Roosevelt himself lost over half of his cattle he decided to get out of the business. 
The experience, however, shaped Roosevelt's beliefs about the need for conservation in America. Those beliefs, in turn, helped shape his policies as president. Visitors to Theodore Roosevelt National Park can experience the Badlands just as Roosevelt did hundreds of years ago. They can also visit the Maltese Cross Cabin as well as the Elkhorn Ranch area. The park has three main areas the South Unit, the North Unit, and the Elkhorn Ranch Unit. In the South Unit, visitors can drive along the scenic Loop Road. It offers many places to see wildlife and the surrounding badlands. Badlands are very dry places with little vegetation. Wind and water shape badlands mainly through erosion. The process leaves behind high, flat topped hills of clay and other soft rock. Many visitors stop to look at Painted Canyon. It gets its name from the colorful exposed rocks there. Trails near the canyon offer visitors a chance to see animals, from the huge American bison to small black tailed prairie dogs. These animals are not really dogs. They are rodents. Roosevelt described prairie dogs as the most noisy and inquisitive animals imaginable. The North Unit also offers several hiking trails. Some paths are short and easy, others may take two days to complete. The Achenbach Trail is a 28 kilometer long path. It crosses the Little Missouri River and takes visitors into the heart of the Theodore Roosevelt wilderness. The third area of the park is the Elkhorn Ranch Unit. This is what Roosevelt described as his home ranch. He wrote of the ranch in this way My home ranch house stands on the river brink. From the low, long veranda shaded by leafy cottonwoods, one looks across sandbars and shallows to a strip of meadowland, behind which rises a line of sheer cliffs and grassy plateaus. Today, the Elkhorn Cabin itself no longer stands. Visitors will find only stone rocks. Where the cabin once was. The area that surrounds Elkhorn, however, is among the most beautiful, wild, and quiet places in the Badlands of North Dakota. It is this peace and beauty that appealed to Roosevelt after the deaths of his mother and wife. But the Dakota Badlands. Did more than just help Roosevelt overcome his pain. They helped shape the kind of president he would later become. In the words of Roosevelt himself, I would not have been president had it not been for my experience in North Dakota. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm John Russell. That's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak.